can't say. What's that word you use? Spoilers. I like that word. Hello and welcome to Spoiler Nation. Hey. Uh, the podcast where we have spoiler-filled discussions on your favorite and some of your not-so-favorite movies and TV shows. My name is Howie, and I'm the senior editor at IsolatedNation.com. And welcoming back, <laughs> Grogu himself, <laughs> um, Reese. Hey, what's going on? You had to go to Japan for a while. Yeah, and uh, when I came back, there was... We kind of tried to organize, I think, again for a pod for something else. For something else, yeah. But now we've got like um, a couple of things we really want to talk about. And what are we doing? Boba Fett and (laughs) come on, come on. Exactly. So we will start with an indie film, uh, a little movie called Come On, Come On, directed by Mike Mills. Yeah, Uh, starring Joaquin Phoenix. And I believe it's an A24 yeah movie yeah uh, and then we have the book of boba fett which is a spin-off of the very popular hit disney slash star wars show the mandalorian mm-hmm. so that's uh, going to be the show today so let's start with come on come on when you think about the future how do you imagine it'll be what will stay with you <laughs> And what will you forget? (laughs) How will your city change? Will families be the same? Keeps asking me why we don't talk. You could tell him the truth. Mom died and got into all that weird stuff. That weird stuff of our entire lives. What scares you? Jesse! Where'd you go? What makes you angry? You are just terrible at this. Oh man, I'm trying. (laughs) Yeah, let's get into it. It's directed by Mike Mills, uh, who directed one of my favorite movies in 2016, I believe, or 2016, 2017, uh, uh, called 20th Century Women. Uh, And before that, he also directed a very uh, kind of a popular kind of indie hit called Beginners uh, that stars uh, Christopher Plummer and Ewan McGregor. That's the 2010 one you were telling me about, right? I think so, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's a good drama uh, slash comedy, I, I suppose. Um, Mike Mills is famous for meaningful humanistic stories told yeah. in, a, in, a, in a quite a stylistic way. Uh, so, um, and this movie... Come on, come on is no different. So this movie stars Joaquin Phoenix. Yeah. So Joaquin Phoenix is a he's some kind of like a blogger or journalist. Yeah, something I think like he's that. kind of Interviewer. a ra- radio journal, you know, radio journalist, podcaster, you but, know, like yeah. NPR type. Vaguely kind of nebulous job, but you know, he travels around uh, America interviewing young people, mainly asking them about the future or how they feel about things. Yeah, uh, that's kind of his job, and he's he has to look after his nephew because his sister and her husband uh, they're having like a lot of serious issues. Like he has bipolar, it mm-hmm. seems like. So she has to go look after him. So he has to look after this kid he doesn't know very well. And the the format of the movie is kind of a road trip. Like he's working in New York, and he's taking the kid along with him. And much of the film, like the plot and the emotion, is uh, their relationship kind of growing. Um, and I will say about this film is, you know, sometimes you watch films and you can feel that there's like a, a genuine compassion for the, the you know, the human experience. Um, yeah. that's, that's not, um, insincere. It's, it's, mm-hmm. it comes from a very real place. And that is this film, uh, Joaquin Phoenix and the kid, you know, they're very beautiful together. Their performances are wonderful. The photography as well, the black and white look. Um, very it's interesting because you know we were talking about this straight after the movie yeah which uh, we just came from but uh it it almost does this it's not shot on film but it does this thing where it conveys a certain kind of magic 
um, that is not often seen in digital filmmaking. Yeah, it's it's very dreamy in terms of how it renders or the light because of the lighting it uses. the The black and white is just delicious, a feast for the eyes. Certainly, and it's like um, but the actual content of the film it's uh it's very mundane. Yeah, not in like a boring way. And what's really great about this movie, or that I was most immediately impressed by was the editing Mm -hmm. which you know i guess you could define as how do you flow through the story like how do you go from scene to scene or one little drama to the next um and this movie's editing is like a buttery smooth (laughs) it's a it's 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 wonderful it flows perfectly yeah because you know as you can imagine from how you've described the story it's uh, it's kind of a Richard Linklater style sort of mundanity. You know, it the story comes from the small conversations and interactions uh, people have with one another. Uh, of course, with the central relationship being the uncle nephew relationship. Yeah. But you know, you have phone calls with him and his sister, uh, and of course, how he talks to the other kids he's interviewing. Mike Mills does this magic trick with how he puts th- this story together. I don't know how he does it, but it hacks into our minds almost by subliminally filling in the blanks of the history of this family, of how they feel about one another through quick cuts, yeah. overlaying present conversations. Yeah, That's what you mean, right? By, That's by what the I mean. smoothness. It's, mm-hmm. You hardly notice it, and yet it tells you a lot without saying so much. Yeah, and I really uh, appreciated the kind of underlying message of the movie, which is about how uh, you, you grow up and you get older and you cause friction with people and you really don't mean to, mm. and you don't know why. Yeah. And <laughs> it makes you feel tired. Um, and you... Uh, a lot of that is also an inability to like express uh, how you're feeling or why you're feeling resentful at certain things. Mm-hmm. Um, and you can see this when he's interviewing like children and he's hanging with a child yeah. and uh, they have a way of putting things honestly, which is, is really poignant. Like me and you were talking about a scene, which I think for both of us, it nearly kind of made us choke up. Yeah. I got really <laughs> choked up and it was such a, Blink and you'll miss it. It kind is. Of scene. It's, it's a literally a eleven second scene with this little uh, Asian kid, and the kid's talking about how he feels a little stifled from his mother in expressing like sadness, and uh, yeah, my God, that kid. <laughs> he, he, yeah, I, I don't. I, I, I don't know if it was real or yeah, not real. I assume that they are the sub. The you know subjects that they pick for the quote-unquote podcast yeah they seem real yeah I, I don't think that they're like they've given a script to say um it has a they, spontaneous feeling yes, to it they don't feel they don't look like they're acting no uh, yeah first of all as and, and then you compare it with this kid who is obviously clearly you know give a storyline things like that yeah, yeah it's acting uh, yeah good exactly. acting but... very good very good very uh naturalistic uh kind of acting but I think it was just five seconds, and yeah. uh, the real emotion that they they get to capture with this kid is is so, it floored me. And it's so unexpected and kind of out of nowhere too. Yeah, um, yeah I would say this movie pretty perfect to me. Yeah, I mean, I I loved it. Uh, so I think that you have on one side of the spectrum someone like Noah Baumbach who is very, um, at least in his early works or his defining works, he's quite, um, what do you call it when you're like anti-human or you see the worst in humans? Uh, not cynical. But yeah, what, what do you call it? Like a... Misanthropic. Misan- misanthropic. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so, but it's an equally valid uh, approach towards, you know, exploring... Um, how who we are as well, it's, people. It's, they're both honest. Yeah, but I feel yeah. like they're both side. They're on the very opposite ends of the spectrum. I think Noah Baumbach explores everything from a a, a cynical, misanthropic lens, mm-hmm. which is very valid. And then Mike Mills explores everything from a very humanistic, uh, I guess, positive, compassionate 
lens where yeah. people are. Yeah, I think this movie is dripping with compassion. Mm-hmm. You know, from the actual job of Joaquin Phoenix's uh, uh, character Johnny, his job is to listen to children talk about themselves and their lives, and to uh, how these people treat each other. So we have um, his sister Viv, who is played by Gabby Hoffman, in a, in a great role, and she has to take care of her separated, uh, you know, her husband who is separated from her through his, you know, his mental health issues and his difficulties. And then we have, of course, the uncle and nephew trying to connect to each other. Uh, and and they are successful and they fail in different in ways. For sure, throughout and this movie, I really appreciated how they show, suggested like just how draining and, and difficult it must be to like be married to someone with these kinds of problems as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was very well acted by uh, what's his name, Scoot McNary. Scoot I think. McNary in a very yeah. uh. I love this guy. He's a great actor, yeah. and he's in such a bit role, but he does it well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you could kind of you could feel her exhaustion mm-hmm. with having to take care of him and take care of this. You know, he's a very bright kid, but you know, you get a bright, expressive kid. That's it's goddamn draining, I imagine. <laughs> to deal, <laughs> yeah, to, to deal with that because he's just a kid. Yeah. Uh, um, and you could uh, really feel for her, like how she didn't really know what how she she should be taking care of him um and you know taking care of herself as well what yeah yeah it's like uh, like you said there's like a lot of uh compassion dripping in this movie uh, you feel for everybody <laughs> <laughs> yeah and uh obviously what because of this kind of compassionate lens to its characters i think what the movie depicts well is how complexly hard it is to raise a child yeah. And uh, especially if you, let's say you're a single mother or a single parent, there are just so, you know, what is the right way? Because there are just so many considerations that you, you, you need to think about. And there's so many, so much room for mistakes. And, you know, this is the line in the, in the movie, which is no one knows what they're doing. And, you know, everyone's just trying their best. I really, that line had a, a lot more meaning because she also expresses how if she's like yelled at her kid, she like you know googles how to apologize <laughs> it's called repair or something yeah it's called <laughs> yeah, a repair and i i never thought of something like that happening in like modern parenting because I, I don't think about modern parenting yeah. it's not part of my life right but i'm like yeah that that would totally happen like you would google how to <laughs> if you yell at your kid or lose your temper how would you repair it yeah quickly yeah. and he and Joaquin phoenix you know he loses his temper at the kid at one point and there's a very funny kind scene where yeah. he has to read the apology from Google to the kid <laughs> and you know the kid the kid accepts his apology <laughs> yeah what i love the love about that scene and there are many instances of that through the movie is that he it's not like he's hiding that he's reading a script to this child they you know they know that he he knows you know this child play uh, Jesse uh, played by Woody Norman uh, mm. it knows that his uncle is reading from a script, but goes with it anyway. And I love the, um, I feel like part of the message is you know transparency, yeah, for honesty. Sure. In this yeah. movie goes such a long way in making you feel closer to each other, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, silence and like keeping secrets and not being honest can have a a detrimental kind of effect on you. And, and this is, I think the movie explores that in a very, it's not obvious, you know, it's, it's a very subtle way. It's just, it's just kind of played out in these magical small moments. Yeah. And like, it's, we say it's not obvious, but it's not obfuscated either. Yeah. It's not hidden. It's not hidden from you. Uh, It's just a very, thoughtfully integrated into the scenes and the overall plot of the movie. And that's why it's very, I guess you see this kind of thing on paper, Mm. like the the script, and you can imagine it being executed in a way that's very like treacly and rote and, you know, whatever. Like I could really imagine that, but um, he put it together in this uh, sincere, thoughtful, it's funny uh, as well, sometimes it's really funny. Yeah, <laughs> that kid especially. Yeah. Well, speaking of the kid, I think a subs- 
kind of a big reason why these little moments play so well is because of the chemistry between the actors. You know, more specifically, For sure. obviously between Joaquin Phoenix and Woody Norman, who plays this nine-year-old kid who has to go through these tantrums and has to go through, uh, you know, has to express the kind of inner life of a child through his expressions. Mm -hmm. And I think he does it so well. I'm kind of shocked by how how skillful this kid is we the kind of acting that i sometimes don't see in older you know young adults yeah i think it's it's down to the directing hmm. i mean i think he directed this kid in a way where he just um got exactly what he needed from him and I don't know how you, because I don't, have you ever tried talking to a kid? Like, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's fucking difficult. But somehow, he's like masterfully directed this kid to give this very good performance. Well, it's, it's <laughs> I, I'm kind of shocked because I feel like, but the, here's the thing. I feel like uh, someone like uh, the kid from uh, Room. What's his name? Jacob something? Yeah, I remember. Anyway, I know who you're the kid about. from Room is like, effervescent and naturalistic in his acting and you can tell like under a good director he he gives magic mm -hmm. but i feel like with uh, woody norman i think there is skill there in his performance where he can actually convey complexity yeah in in his in his reactions and in the way that he delivers his lines that i think they kind of hit the gold mine with this with yeah. this kid so should i call you like Papa or Dad or just Johnny? You can call me whatever feels comfortable to you. I, I, I don't know. It's just I'm not used to being able to choose. Maybe we can just take this process slowly and and, and see, how, see how it feels. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I'm just really sorry that your children died. Um, you know, I don't think I can do that part. Yeah, I, I told you that's how me and mom do it. If it makes sense for your mom to do that, that's cool, but it doesn't make sense for me, and that's what oh, I was explaining to you. Why doesn't make sense for you? It's, because it's ridiculous. Is it? It's sad. The question is, why do you want to do it? You are just terrible at this. Oh, man, I'm trying. Let, let me ask you a question. Why does everything have to be like this kind of weird, eccentric thing that like you do? I know, yeah, but why not just do something normal? Like What's everything normal? in your real life. What's normal? Okay, fine. Good point. And Joaquin Phoenix just fits the role so well. Yeah, we were we were saying after this about Joaquin Phoenix kind of career trajectory where I could imagine like you know, fourteen years ago you could easily see him being typecast as this like slimy repellent villainous kind of character because he plays it so well in like gladiator gladiator yeah. um the master i mean you feel bad for him in the master but he's disgusting <laughs> he's a bad person he's a bad person <laughs> but then um you see the trailer for something like her where he has this kind of weird love it seems like he has a weird love affair with a machine and you right, think right. oh this is creepy and then you watch him in that and you're like wow this is very normal and yeah uh, you know, he he can play like a very straightforwardly sensitive character with no malice. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah, that's what I was going to say. He portrays sensitivity so well that it completely transforms him into a different guy. Well, you, you believe he's a great listener. Yeah. So which yeah. is key for this role Absolutely. especially, and it adds to the warm feeling of this movie. Yeah. Um. So you can't. Un he he really carries. I mean, him and the kid probably carry it equally, I'd say. Yeah. But, you know, he's the adult and he's got to, you know. Um, so that, after this movie, I'm like really cemented in the idea that I would watch him in anything. <laughs> <laughs> Joaquin Phoenix. He seems to pick his roles very uh, deliberately and thoughtfully. And he's in that position where he can do that because he's very successful. He's like a big name. Yeah. 
um, yeah, so Howie, would you recommend? Come oh, on, come uh, on? absolutely. <laughs> I give it five out of five stars. You know, if you're looking for, uh, you know, when we say like, they don't make this kind of movies anymore. I feel like this is the kind of movies that people are talking about and it is getting made. So if you, you're have, looking, to, you have to support it with your money. Exactly. <laughs> Go exactly. watch it. So yeah. I think if you are looking for a well-made drama that, you know, makes you believe in humanity again, I think this is the movie for you. Yeah, it's, um, it's definitely dealing with some difficult things we all deal with, mm-hmm. but it deals with it in such a compassionate and hopeful way yeah. that at the end, you, you feel better than when you walked in. It's great. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's lovely. I give it five out of five too. Awesome. Well, all right. All right. Well, let's uh, dive deep into the other end of the spectrum. Let's talk about The Book of Boa Fett. Jabba ruled with fear. I intend to rule with respect. You were all once captains under Jabba the Hutt. I'm here to make a proposal that's mutually beneficial. Why speak of conflict? When cooperation can make us all rich. What prevents us all from killing you and taking what we want? If he had spoken such insolence to Java, he'd have fed you to his menagerie. Please. Speak freely. Yeah, so like you said, I guess this is a spin off the off the Mandalorian. Mm-hmm. It follows the bounty hunter Boba Fett, who now wants to be I guess he's kind of like a crime lord of Tatooine. What's the name? The <laughs> Dio Mia Who the Who the fuck cares? Yeah, I mean Or it, who knows even. Well, both. Who knows and who cares, which is the <laughs> problems plaguing more than anything it's the problems plaguing this particular show um if you take it back to a really basic idea of boba fett like yeah in empire strikes back yeah which is you know that's like the bible for this character that's Mm -hmm. what made him popular you know what is he he has a cold as venom voice Mm -hmm. he is the only one unafraid of darth vader he's very competent and there's a interesting history suggested with him Mm -hmm. um and this show has sort of reduced him to a very generic gruff warrior type (laughs) who wants to be the leader of a a tribe or like a, a bunch of he wants to be a leader of some kind yeah and um any ambiguity or villainy or you know maliciousness that's inherent in that character is totally scrubbed away just to build off from that right yeah. in terms of to bring us to where we are now in in this iteration of the star wars you know whatever cinematic universe disney whatever yeah part of the core I- issue or part of the uh big challenge for uh i guess uh John Favreau or the Disney people mm-hmm. with Boba Fett is the co- what you consider to be cool and you know fun about the idea of Boba Fett as a character has already been absorbed by their hit character the Mandalorian. Yes. Right. Obviously when he his, you know his show was teased everyone's thinking oh that's is that Boba Fett, you know? Okay, turns out it's a different character. We fall in love with him and, of course, Baby Yoda. Yeah. But the thing is, he is the perfect evolution of what we expect a kind of badass, quote-unquote, you know, Mandalorian armor-wearing Boba Fett could could go into, I yeah. think. Yeah. But there is an inherent coolness in uh, the Mandalorian. So then you can't just repeat that. No, especially if you don't have a good hook. Yeah. Like the hook with the Mandalorian was, like you said, it was he has to look after this baby. Yeah. And, um, you know, he grows to care about the kid in a... It's a genuine way. I mean, mm. people 
people really responded to that central relationship. The show is not like it's not amazing, but that relationship and the Star Warsy stuff, it it's great. Like yeah. it's a, it's a fun yeah. show. This is just they're like, well, people liked that let's try to make another thing but they didn't find like an interesting there's sketches of good ideas yes like boba fett becoming part of the tribes of tatooine with the tuscan raiders and you learn a bit about their culture it's pretty cool but it doesn't pay off in any way and it it felt like it was for nothing and i still don't know why he wants to be this uh whatever crime lord in Tatooine. Yeah. It's, he doesn't even commit crimes, so... <laughs> it's it's kind of... It's confusing. I, yeah, I think I yelled at the TV, like, pick a side, you know? Because I think a, a core issue with the show, and obviously, I uh, hate to let the cat out of the bag, I think we have, like... A, <laughs> we don't look at this... We have a lot of criticisms about this show, but, but uh, I think a core issue is how they... It's it's a very perplexing show in its how it structures itself and how it's it tells its story of its own main character because the like you said the the there are bubbles of potential. I even yeah. like the idea of Boba Fett coming into Jabba's territory and trying to take it over, and he has to negotiate with the, these different factions. I think it's a good idea. It's a great idea, yeah. except the first four episodes or first three, or, well, the first few episodes they that they spend in on this show is, uh, you know, I I believe almost eighty percent of the runtime focuses on his fake good guy origin story. Of yep. you know his relationship with the with the uh, the Tuscan the Tuscan Raiders, yeah. and that is not necessarily a bad idea. However, a function of flashbacks in episodic television is that it informs the it, present. Yeah, it story. informs the present. But what you get is twenty percent. Uh, hey, Boba Fett, this is our problem right now. Anyway, so the back to your flashbacks. If they did something it, like. Not that I want to write a better show or whatever, you know, whatever. But yeah. if it was something like they do the flashbacks and in the present, he's trying to unite this town yes. or he's trying to get to know the people of the town. Then I understand his motivation. Like he's trying to create a tribe. He's trying to do something yeah. or he wants to recreate that family because he, you know, there's flashbacks to his dad leaving. So he's got some hole in his heart. Obviously, that he's trying to fill. Fine, it's a yeah, it's I, a I, it's a human motivation. These are yeah, I, I'm totally fine with that. Yeah, but they don't do that. They like <laughs> they do something really boring. Like yeah, there's like a problem with this guy. He has to talk to this guy. It's just these conversations in empty rooms. Yeah, which gives the the show a kind of a cheap feeling the, uh, at points. Yeah, and the, it's not engaging. And that's just the first bunch of episodes, and then you get these great Man the Mandalorian, Mandalorian season, episodes. season two point five. Yeah, yeah. And, and then you've got a a finale which ostensibly ties it together, but it's very strange in some parts as well. And I think this is Robert Rodriguez. He's directed a lot of this show. Mm. I I don't love his chintzy aesthetic <laughs> for this. <laughs> universe you know what i'm saying well like explain the, the, like what i mean is the prime example is the um who are those mods people like the oh the teen the, the teens? Teen teenagers that shit it just looks really okay. aesthetically wrong can i say okay it is but honestly it's the most interesting thing that has happened in boba fett's side of the show yeah, you know <laughs> uh, well but true it's fun. But like you know, know. it's it's in, it's wrong in a fun way i feel like i i was like all right this is like i can at least ironically laugh when they show up yeah yeah we, that's true yeah it's just it's so it's such a weird choice and i think also the setting of tatooine hmm. i mean i know he had the thing with the tuscan raiders on tatooine yeah. but like they died so what is Tatooine to him? Like, right, right. I liked in, not to tangent too much, but that Mandalorian episode when he's on that giant halo ring. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I was like, what? Like, I was like, wow. Like, look at this. 
you know, environments. Like it's so interesting and cool and we haven't seen it before. And it had a totally different oh, feel. Oh, you, you mean yeah. you mean the the episode where the yeah. Mandalorian shows up in this movie called The Book of Boba Fett? That's what I mean. Yeah. It's like yeah. why why could why Tatooine? Like I, I'm just tired of the <laughs> the desert setting. I am just absolutely flabbergasted. I think a core issue is for a show called with the name Boba Fett in the title, we don't spend that much time with him in the present, no. you know? So we don't actually feel the stakes of what he's even trying to do here. And and the thing is, this is what you get by trying to have your cake and eat it too. Yeah. Is he a good guy or is he a bad guy? Because being a mob person... <laughs> you're bad. You're you're literally a parasite <laughs> yeah. on the society you're in. Habit. You're not you're not a sheriff. Yeah. You're not a mayor. You're literally like a parasite. People have to pay. Uh, uh what, what what do they call it? Like uh, like tribute money, tribute racketeering money to, yeah. stuff. There's just like, like you use violence to control people. The drugs run through. But what? They, yeah. But he he doesn't do any of that. So I'm like, well, how does this operation work? Like, and, how does he make the money? <laughs> at one point, he goes, uh, yeah, forget about the spice. It's killed too much people. I'm like, dude, that's the whole thing. What, yeah. what are you doing here then? Yeah, why do... How do you imagine, like, he's a bad business person. Like, this, it's such a, it's so funny because it's kind of like, do we want Boba Fett to succeed? Because I don't think he will be efficient in running this town. Look at, like, the, the only key people who are tied to him which are these uh um the sanctuary they're blown to bits yeah and they were supposed to be under your protection i mean come on well i think that's the core issue with the conception of this show is that it wants to utilize the gangster window dressing yeah it has no interest or clue in deploying it in like a way that makes any kind of sense yeah like at all like um I guess the prequel trilogy had a lot of political kind of thriller stuff in it. Yeah. It wasn't the most engaging, but the core idea was it it was pretty cool like and it made sense how like the republic fell and became the empire. And and you at, at least understood whose side people are yeah, on and you why understand they who's want... doing what and yeah. why they're doing it. Yeah. And in this it's just like it's like a giant shrug. Like, I don't know. <laughs> like, and, I couldn't tell you. And it's kind of a shame because I wanted to like this show, you mm. know? And and there are instances of pockets of potential, like we said, because let's say, fine. Okay, Boba Fett is like so clueless and consistently makes the wrong decisions. But they actually have a seed of that because uh, Fennec Shen... Uh, yeah. played by Ming Na Wen, who's like this assassin person. She consistently advises him, like, "Hey, don't do this," mm-hmm. you know, or "Hey, make this other decision." And there is at least potential there to make these two characters more interesting by having them argue with each other. But they don't actually do that. Like always, it seems like either like Ming, uh, well, uh, Fennec Shen is always just on his side. Yeah, there's never been a but fundamental budding of heads. It's just like, hey, don't do this, don't do this, and then he does it, and then she's like, all right, you and know, she, it, she just goes along with it. I yeah, guess. the yeah. focus of uh, there is a such a lack of focus on these characters that is very shocking to me because you know, like, especially when you immediately contrast it in such a whiplash way with the Mandalorian when the very first scene that he shows up in in episode 5, chapter 5, Return of the Mandalorian, (laughs) you're just like, I'm in. I understand his struggles. I understand what he's trying to do like through his actions. And you you are so like honed into this character. And and that episode... (laughs) Boba Fett does not show up not for even once. a second. And the way the Mandalorian like just takes care of business in that opening scene, it's like, wow, Boba Fett hasn't done anything like this. It, it kind of reminds, it kind of yeah, reminds you of how lame Boba Fett is. It does. That's that's all it. That's what it does. It serves to like highlight, wow, you've got like a much more interesting show. I'd rather watch here <laughs> than than Boba Fett. But 
And in the ne- the next episode, they even add uh, like Luke Skywalker to the. So we'll talk about that a bit. Yeah. Well. Y- yeah. Shall we yeah. do a Mandalorian segue? Uh, you mean the show, The Mandalorian? Oh no, no, like the Mandalorian part of this. Show. Oh yeah, sure. Because the yeah. show does that, so we've got no choice. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's how the literally how it goes. Yeah. So chapter six. From the desert comes a stranger. So this is the one you're talking about. Luke Skywalker yeah. shows up. Uh, and essentially every ancillary character from the TV show, The Mandalorian, is And the in Clone this. Wars, yeah. like Cad Bane and Ahsoka. <laughs> it's kind of a free-for-all. Everyone except, you know, Boba Fett shows up for five seconds. He's got a cameo. Of yeah. Like a, yeah, exactly. Five, one Good, line, five yeah, seconds. Glad to be there. He's like back to his roots as just a little <laughs> yeah. background character. Le- yeah. So let's talk about the whole... Mandalorian stuff and what it means, you know. Yeah, let's get into that. So we've got of like straight away we've pretty much got uh, Luke, um, a much improved digital effect. Yes. Um, and he is entirely a digital effect down to the voice. I found out it's actually wait. So the voice is synthetic. Wait, what? Mark yeah. Hamill didn't even you say didn't even. I don't think he said any of the lines. Holy shit! Yeah, it's um. And this is a thing, I it's kind of a rumor, I'm not 100%, okay. but like Marvel has scanned all of the actors, so they own their voice <laughs> and the digital all right. models as well. Welcome to the end times. Yeah, so we've got this very bizarre <laughs> thing where you've got Luke, um, as you'd kind of imagine since you were a kid, like, oh, he's training people, He's mm. he looks young, but it's a little curious because it's, it's a soulless performance like yeah I mean, it's not a human being so it's you're kind of it's very cool but you're not I, a fan i don't know i'm just i'm very ambivalent on it I, I there's good and bad about it i'm worried about the trend of this like they can mimic it so well that it's gonna go in this weird yeah. direction but they've been working on that since well, rogue uh, one with Tarkin right. and, and leia, leia. Yeah. they did in episode nine so I see what they're doing and I'm I'm worried about it. But Okay. Um th- as far as actual story stuff in the scenes, I liked them. Yeah. It yeah, was, he it was, was cool. used he was used quite economically, I think. So so I don't have a huge issue with it. Um uh I wouldn't even mind if they in these shots where they have to use Luke, they just show us the voice and, you know, like shoot creatively around his face. I don't really need to see his face. Oh, but that was shoving it in your face. <laughs> like, yeah, I, that I know. was showing off that but th- tech. Th- but that's what I mean. Like, <laughs> yeah. I think uh, look, it was fine. It didn't bother me at all. Like, I, it is. It does look way better. <laughs> it than... does. It's it's kind of crazy how much it improved. And yeah. like, I think because they had there was a deep fake guy on YouTube. Yeah, they hired and they him. hired him right. Yeah. So which was a very smart move on their part yeah because after the uh his first appearance in uh, season two yeah the deep some a uh, youtuber who specializes in deep fakes or visual effects essentially recreated that scene and and he looks way more realistic than the actual show so they hired him yeah uh which is a good idea but i guess um let's backtrack a bit so in terms of the mandalorian he is no longer... So we get this scene where he is briefly reunited. This is in uh, episode five, his mm-hmm. fir- uh, his first appearance on the show, uh, with his tribe. Yeah. Uh, uh, and then you, you know, you've got the woman leader. And then this guy wants... He doesn't know how to use the, uh, the dark, saber. dark saber. And then uh, what do you make of that scene? So this guy... Uh, obviously wants to fight him for it and fails. And then she, um, uh, this, the leader goes, have you, uh, have you open, you know, have you uh, taken off your mask? And obviously, yes, very briefly, but you know, uh, so that immediately disqualifies him from this kind of sect of the Mandalore club. Yeah, they, club. they banish him, but they imply that he can be uh, kind of redeemed at this particular place on in some Ma- planet yeah. in Mandalore? Do or? you think that this woman leader did this on purpose to send him that way? Or do you think that she's just no, I think she's, so strict? She's with that? so like because dogmatic and like a fundamentalist. Are you sure? Because I feel like um, the way that she... like. So that means that this question was always at the back of her mind and she chose to ask that question like right then after mm-hmm. he wins. Yeah. You know, I just feel like it almost feels like she realizes 
for him to have a chance of reclaiming like Mandalore, mm-hmm. he needs to go out on his own to yeah, do it. Yeah, I think she ultimately wants him to do that, or she wouldn't have mentioned it. I guess. Yeah, you know, like I think it was used strategically. Yeah, because otherwise, I feel like it seems very short-sighted. And I kind of like this character, and I don't want to see her as like a short-sighted character. But maybe they are. You yeah. Know? Um, well, you know the show. The show is called The Mandalorian, yeah. so I assume his like exile is a a temporary obstacle, <laughs> and that'll that'll be a big thrust of season three, I imagine. Actually, mm. like he'll want to reintegrate into that. Yeah, I liked the backstory of all of them getting most of them getting wiped out by the Empire. Yeah, yeah, they kind of take inspiration from a real historical thing there. Uh, actually, oh, really? Because she calls that night. Um, the night of a thousand tears, mm-hmm. and there was this um thing with the uh, Native American history, uh, where a lot of them were killed in some region. It was a really big region, and they called that the Trail of Tears. I see. So I was like, well, yeah, they're, they're pulling from some, uh, you know, really nasty, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> real life history, history yeah. there. Um, and the way that backstory was filmed, it was it was really well done. I, I really liked that. I liked that. it too. Yeah, it was like movie quality shit. Yeah, you know? yeah. beautiful. Uh, direct, uh, that episode directed by Bryce Dallas Howard. Uh, she, she found new ways of like filming flight, mm-hmm. like with the Naboo starship mm-hmm. and there was, dif- there was different framing yeah. as well that made space seem incredibly big. <laughs> like some of her shots she selected there. Yeah. Um, I hope she's going to direct most of... The Mandalorian season three episodes actually, and then of course the ne- the episode after is uh, directed by Dave Filoni, yeah, um, uh, and it continues because we, <laughs> I, when I saw the episode five, I was like, this is a joke, right? Like this is <laughs> a monumental. It's not monumental yet, right? But it's very important character motivations and character history for a character that's not supposed to be in this show. And then he flies off to to presumably see Grogu slash Baby Yoda. And, and I'm like, okay, uh, you know, that was an amazing episode. But I guess we'll go back to Boba Fett now. And that's then, and then yeah. next episode, <laughs> Luke Skywalker. <laughs> Ahsoka. Ahsoka. Uh, uh Yeah, so... What did you think of this episode? Very cool to see Ahsoka again. Although, what is she doing there? Slash Luke and Ahsoka may be a thing. You reckon? Really? I don't know. I mean, she's very, like, flirty. That's just <laughs> Rosario Dawson's natural charisma. It's like, <laughs> she what? has chemistry with everybody. I just wonder what, what, she's, what she's doing there. And anyway, so... That's a good. That's a good point. Like, what is she doing? There? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm joking about the flirting thing. Yeah, but, but I, I actually they, forgot why she's there. Yeah, it almost feels like, and honestly, I have no issue with this. No, no. Which is, it almost feels like a little like fan service of like, hey, remember Ahsoka's gonna come? Because why? Why not do an ad for a different show? Which Content, is, honestly, I don't mind because I love her. Mm-hmm. But it, she does somehow feel a little out of place because theoretically is. Uh, at the core of this episode called The Book of Boba Fett, the central, <laughs> it is the central uh, choice that Baby Yoda from the show The Mal- Mandalorian has to make. Mm-hmm. You know, is his focus on um, being a Jedi or does he want to go back to, um, uh, what is his name, The Mandalorian? Din Djarin. Din, yeah. yeah, Din Djarin. Because he makes this cute little chain, you know, a uh, Baskar chainmail, yeah, uh, for for Baby Yoda and um, uh, Ahsoka stops him from seeing him because, as we both know, or as you know, Star Wars fans know, Jedi the Jedi training and part of that is you need to be kind of attachments can hold you hold you down, mm-hmm. and uh, if he sees. Um, if he sees uh, the Mandalorian, Baby Yoda, it's going to make things really hard for Baby Yoda to not think about him and and hold on to that attachment, and yeah. which is why uh, obviously Ahsoka stops him. Uh, and this is where maybe my la- I don't really know like I didn't watch a lot of the Clone War stuff, but my understanding is Ahsoka isn't really she's like not quite the she's not a Jedi anymore technically right she's no. like a uh, so I would imagine that her views are more uh, complex, if that makes sense. I think, from what I remember in the show, she leaves the Jedi Order because it 
she sees that it's become compromised, but I think she believes in the way in the of ideal. The, I see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I it's I think she still believes, and this is like a chance to start anew because it's just Luke and right, Grogu. Right. Right. So I think she wants to preserve. I see the religion mm, or the mm. teachings of the Jedi. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Which I think, you know, in a universe where the force exists and it can be used in these ways, I think those teachings actually make a lot of sense. Okay. In my opinion, I think some people disagree like they think the gray Jedi should be a thing. I think that doesn't oh, okay. I think that doesn't happen. Well, I I don't know. <laughs> yeah, so obviously uh very cute to see a training montage with yeah. Luke, Scott, Luke and Grogu, um, uh, and especially when he waves him around. Uh, yeah, because that he was, was like, very cool. He can't walk that far. <laughs> yeah. Um, and but uh, a kind of a monumental moment is the flashback that he that Baby Yoda gets to... when he sees Order sixty six. Yeah, that was very unexpected. Yeah. So I'm like, wait, he was. In the Jedi Temple, right, and what? he was uh, somehow he escapes. So, like it seemed like a hopeless situation. So yeah. it's interesting to learn more about how he escapes uh, uh, this situation. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's very interesting. But obviously, Luke has this uh, um, doubt of like, "Hey, you want to do this or not?" Mm-hmm. Right, and yeah. he said this thing of, "It's more like he's remembering that I taught him." That's interesting. What, what do you think about that? I think, yeah, because he obviously has some kind of history of being with the Jedi and training with them, possibly. Right, and it's it almost seems like his memory was is wiped. wiped. Which is, I think, what they're going to hint more at in Mandalorian Season 3. Um, yeah. That'll be cool to see. I, yeah. I hope we get more backstory there. Um, I yeah. think I think that's what it is. Mm. And he presents, you know, and obviously he presents uh, Yo- Baby Yoda with this choice. Yeah, you can um, do this or have the chainmail. What did you think of Luke presenting that choice? I don't. Okay, so I understand it. Yeah, I understand it. However, I more of a, have a, I have a bigger problem with his reaction to the choice. Uh, Next episode, oh, but yeah, I understand. You know, you know, uh, because the demands of being a Jedi requires that focus, mm-hmm. right? So, and, and this is kind of a choice that he is given. Yeah. Not 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 to, between the two, but he ultimately, you know, it's, it's just very interesting that Luke Skywalker is giving this ultimatum. And given that we know his journey. Yeah. And his journey, he, I honestly don't think that he actually follows directly the let go of attachment no. side of the Jedi way. He has a strong connection to, you know, Han and um, you know, Leia, etc., you know, and he Well he ultimately... abandoned his training <laughs> yeah. to save them. Right. Right. Which which fucked him up actually because he was defeated and <laughs> he was he found out this thing he wasn't ready to hear. So it could be like um, you know, maybe he's trying to prevent the, few, the uh, some compromised kind of thing with Grogu. Yeah. Uh, what What did you think? Um, I thought, yeah, that made sense. But I'm thinking as well, like, how long have you trained him? Like, shouldn't that's you give I, it more time? That's what really? I mean. I I I understand the choice because I just, don't know if I'm I, overthinking that though. Like, the, you know, the thing is, I understand this as an exercise. Yeah. Yeah. I just don't agree with how he handled the situation if that makes sense i you know it could just be an incremental thing like is this how you're gonna get students by training them for a few weeks and then go hey you decide now do you want to go back to your literal dad or do you want to know this unknown thing like i think he hasn't really showed baby yoda why he should be a jedi yeah, yeah yeah and look he's a Look, I know he's ninety years old, but you know, in in the age of his kind, he's, he's a, a ch- baby. Baby, he's a he can't express himself. Yeah, how? <laughs> like, I just I think it's a bit of a harsh, or so a bit of a rash decision on Luke's part, mm-hmm. which I'm quite shocked by because how else your people are dwindling? Like, how else are you going to find more of these Force-sensitive, you know, Jedi people, right? I I do understand the kind of... Because he's never taught 
any this is like his first time teaching right. so i can understand um his doubts and fears but you know what you could get doubts and fears expressed if you had a human being <laughs> in that role <laughs> who could give the nuances of yeah. that expression that's what i actually think the central problem is it's obviously the digital recreation i'm not just talking about the ethics of it but an actor can bring a lot of nuance to something like especially in that situation when you would be afraid and you would be full of doubt i I think that yeah and if you had a a human being in that Mm. role that would come across much better i i know what you mean i think uh you're right like i think they are tied this storyline is uh, kind of chained by the limitations of the technology, so that so they they kind of wrote this in a way that is uh, less than ideal because uh, knowing that they won't have that much flexibility with the with the quote unquote character. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I I still think they should have gotten like some Sebastian Stan or something like that, yeah. some lookalike or some actor to just play luke i agree and well even in this okay even working within the limits of this uh this episode look you have um (laughs) ahsoka standing there right yeah just use her as the conduit if if that makes sense so you know i think with the limitations they had they can have luke stand there and have ahsoka convey the message you know Mm -hmm. use the actual actor you have they yeah. they did use her well in that one scene when she suggests to Mando to not give the thing himself. Uh, uh, yes, that was that was great. But I I see what you're saying uh, there as well. Right. So I think the because there is some debate about this, like with Luke giving that choice and his doubts. And I honestly think it just would have come across a lot better if that that was a person performing that. I agree. I yeah. agree. Um, okay. And then, and then we have obviously. Okay, here's the thing, right? I I continue laughing in this episode, in this chapter six, episode six. I'm like, wow, we saw non, almost none of Boba Fett, mm. and then he has to make this choice. I'm like, surely they can't have this choice happen next episode, which is the finale. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> of the Boba Fett show. But they did, right? So let's close off the Mando part and then we'll jump back into Boba Fett. But so that in this episode, we find that, you know, we see the X-Wing flying to Tatooine. Yeah, with R2 in it. Yeah. (laughs) So this is Peli Moto, uh, who is a great character. Love her character. Yeah, I do like her too. The engineer person with the slave robots. Yeah. I love her. She's great. Princess. what, what is Princess she? Carolyn yeah. from uh, Bojack Horseman. <laughs> like in the show, like that's a go for a tangent, but I'm expecting her to bust out into those rhymes that yeah. <laughs> Princess Carolyn would do. Yeah, <laughs> she's so like what a delight to see her. Uh, you know, a main staple of the TV show The Mandalorian. She's really grown on me in the role too. I really enjoy her. Yeah, and I show. and she reacts in a way that we would react by seeing uh, she, Baby Yoda. She's that essential kind of blue collar character. Mm. Mm. Uh, who who's like very relatable? Yeah, yeah. And then you see who is in there. It's Grogu. Yeah. And you're like, wait a minute. Did he just like uh, <laughs> tell him to get fucked? Yeah. Like, kind of. Luke is a Luke is a petty. I mean, can you imagine that? Luke like, is an asshole. What does he do? Luke does, is a, a straight up asshole. Yeah. Does man. he does he just then turn his back on the yeah, baby? He's like, <laughs> like he's like as soon as he chooses the 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 uh, what does he do? the like, chainmail, he turns his back. He's like R two. Do it. And then Andrew just takes him. That's why they didn't show it, because there's no way it doesn't make Luke look bad. Yeah. <laughs> like it's he's he actually when I saw that it's just Grogu, I'm like, holy shit, like Luke is a dick. Like when Luke failed tests on Dagavar, yeah. Yoda didn't say get out. Yeah. Goodbye. See you later. Yeah. And and not just say get out, it's like I'm going to send you defenselessly to a planet that I have no guarantee of your safety. You, a child. And he knows how messed up that planet is yeah. as well. Like, what? It's it's strange. It's strange. It's Yeah, it, it honestly, like, makes me... I'm pissed off at Luke for, for doing that. Really, like, he just... The, you just send him straight here without any resources or anything like that. I mean, of course, R2 is great and, you know... But 
That's just a little droid. That's, you know, <laughs> you know what it is? It's just the rush to reunite Mando and Grogu. Yeah, which, but why? Why yeah, do they need to do that? But they, they, because they just want, they think that's what people want and they don't like think through like how actually, wait a minute, he just fucking booted him off the planet, like turned his back on the kid? Yeah. Okay. You know, people- even Ahsoka, right? Like, you know, Ahsoka's there. So why would Ahsoka go like, yeah, I think they're fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like it's, it's still be fine uh, over there. He, you know, I do know. I personally know that um, the Mandalorian is off to some kind of fighting mission. But all right, yeah, just send him there where he is. I mean, I got to in the moment. I was just like, oh, cool, like he's gonna be in the episode and see Mando. Yeah. So in the moment, I wasn't, you know, thinking about it, but then. You know, after the episode's done and you're, you're, you're like thinking about it, you're like, wait a minute. Like, he just, you know. Yeah, I was furious from the get go because I was just expecting maybe Luke to pop up and, and go like. They purposefully they made it. They just can't do like, that, obviously. They purposefully <laughs> made it a kind of a bait, like, you yeah. know, with the how they shot it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, And most, but most of this episode is obviously like um, Bulba and his crew yeah, let's against, talk about that. against the Pikes, right? Um, It's, it's a lot of action that uh, if it gets it felt repetitive yeah. after a while because the main we, threat we, yes is are these giant droids with these shields and it's, it's like they're yeah. just there's no it's also hard to track um what is winning to them and what is losing to them well, you, know, you know like it's yeah. hard to understand the stakes it's it, it is and it's it's weirder because bulba and mando take a lot of fire and yeah they're not i mean i understand they've got the armor but they seem invincible yeah and the wookie <laughs> he gets shot like a hundred times yeah like just five people like climbed on <laughs> yeah he got, yeah i'm like i understand he's strong but he he is organic material yeah, like yeah. It's he can skin. be killed you know he's skin he's fur he's, he's not a goddamn you know, yeah droid and i i just thought the tactics themselves of the battle it was it was questionable. It's like they're all hiding together in this little bunker. It's so stupid. One, like one man. well-placed grenade would yeah, end it's, it. It's the dumbest thing, and it really makes once again Boba Fett look like an idiot. Like he's he actually seems like, like he doesn't an know idiot. what he's doing. Yeah, and then yeah. he just gonna he's just gonna go with whatever this punk teenagers say. Like That's, yeah, they're yeah. like let's they they play it they play it like such an inspirational moment but guess what for it to be inspirational you have to spend time with these characters well and get us to be invested in them yeah i was watching this episode with with a mate of mine and like when they came on screen in the last episode he was like are they like the producers sons and daughters or I, something that that's kind of felt like i'm that, like yeah. it it has that feeling does it yeah. like they're theater kids yeah <laughs> just yeah. just showing up and um D, they're messing up the verisimilitude of the whole thing. It's so funny because I don't actually hate them. I, I kind of find them fun. But they just don't take the time to, you know, if they took the time to, like, you know, spend let us spend time with them and see how quirky these, like, so out of whack teenagers are, I think there is a way to make them endearing. But they just... Like, I don't even know what they want, you know? Like, they're just no. almost, like, hired guns. So, when they're, like, under threat, I'm like, what are they dying for, really? Like, like you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, why do they have loyalty to Boba <laughs> Fett? Just, <laughs> just because know. he decided to hire them one yeah, day. Yeah, like, but if you're getting killed, like, you know, shot at and, like, caught, you're gonna run away. Like, yeah. And I'm like, also, he took over Jabba the of Hutt's operations. Yeah. Like where is it? Just the pigs? Yeah, where that, are they? Where are the where soldiers? Where are the people? Where's yeah. the muscle? In in every time they have like these like mob discussions, it's laughable because uh, Fennec Shen, who arguably is the only like capable person in this whole operation, she's like, yeah, definitely all right. inarguable. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Definitely, she's like, all right, now now with the um, freelance Mandalorian being here we have the muscle i'm like you're relying you on have that? three people yeah you, is you that... have three people it, it, it's not gonna work yeah and he's not gonna stay there with you forever that's that was the thing i was even thinking of like in the early episodes of this show i'm like where's his 
fucking oper- like where's his people like yeah. his soldiers did he really just walk in and shoot the guy and that's it yeah it's so like you and then he, you got the two pigs and like three punk teenagers yeah it's like a little motley crew of <laughs> and the wookie yeah and the wookie which i thought the wookie he, i thought he got rid of the wookie that's but... barely enough to do admin do, like yeah. that's barely no. enough to do like administ- much needed administration that you would need to do to like keep everyone in line. Look at what happened. Like a whole place was bombed under your your supervision or lack of. Yeah, and it's also like, he, okay, the idea of Boba Fett on the Rancor visually very fun, yeah. very cool. But I, it, it's like you're trying to protect this town and you unleash this fucking monster yeah. and it, why do you have to ride it? you got a jetpack like why do you need to and, and like i also thought about the logic of this i'm just like how is this how is this rancor like loyal to you now yeah yeah because he, he just pet, pets it once <laughs> and somehow it's like it would just like die for him yeah I, I don't know if that's how that works man i think the whole why the rancor thing is scary is that it's uncontrollable you know, like, you can't control it. Like, yeah. That's why it's trapped. Do they, you think it like, react normally once it's out? They just wanted the imagery of that, but they didn't really make it work. Yeah. You know, they just wanted to shortcut to that. It, you know, it's a cool visual, but what really stays with you is, like, how these things connect together. Yeah. And, like, you know, if it actually makes, you know, a lick of sense. Which it doesn't. No, not at all. Yeah. Let... I want to talk about the coolest character in this show. Oh, Cad Bane. Yeah. Yes. I mean, I didn't see this guy in... I didn't watch his episodes of uh, the animated stuff, like the right, Clone Wars. Yeah. I kind of... I guess I would have seen him in Periphery, uh, just because pop culture. But when he shows up... like I w- <laughs> When he shows up and he's facing off against... Um, uh, Cobb Vanth. Yeah, Cobb the, Vanth, the uh, Timothy Oliphant's character. I'm like, I, I want to watch this show. I want to watch this show. Even even the way that they introduced Cobb Vanth back into the show was epic. I, I was like, whoa, yeah. you just conveyed in one scene uh, a character so perfectly that you haven't your main character. You yeah. know, like when he shoots, when he tells the the uh, pikers to like, hey, think it through, you know, and then he shoots them all and then he kicks the spice. Yeah. I'm like, now this is the guy who has stakes <laughs> in this whole operation. Like this is one of the people who actually should try to take control of this thing because his hometown is af- directly affected by it. Yeah. And he can really sell it, you know, because yes. of his experience with justified yeah um he, he's perfect in that role you are immediately on his side and you immediately buy that he is look yes he's he doesn't have the most advanced stuff but you know what he's got the guts and he's got the skills what, to take yeah. this guy this guy on you know? what this show should have been was a personality like that up against cad bane from episode one Abs- absolutely i mean it's it's absolutely. so simple it's nearly stupid yeah it's, it's actually, right there you you've how done did it. you miss it you, you already did it but they've made this like <laughs> over complicated thing yeah. <laughs> instead yeah you made more work for yourself and you've made it like less fun yeah like you know you you just need the cad bane and you need the sheriff in town and they have it out yeah it that's there's seven episodes. That's your story. There was so... I felt so tense in that one yeah. scene where the shootout is going to happen than in the first four episodes of the this show. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Because the conflict was really clear. Yeah. The filmmaking was on point. Yeah. So was the acting, especially Cad Bane's voice oh, as well. Man. And the design. He looks... Sca- I actually look scared looking at his face. He looks angry. Yeah. Even yeah. though like he's just a hired gun. Why, I was like... Why does he look pissed? <laughs> I, I I was like, it's the red was, eyes that was done so well, and it's his gritted teeth as well. Where he's like, you don't want to do this. Oh, that voice, you as know, well. and he's like, yeah. he's like, um, you know, stay neutral, and he's only asking them to stay neutral. That's the thing. That's what's so great about that scene. You're like, whoa, this guy is just asking them to stand down and not like, I will kill you. Yeah, he's not like a cartoonish villain. Yeah. He's just a He's, very believable enforcer kind of guy. Yeah, it was. Yeah, I love that. I hope 
Oh wait, so Cobb Bath isn't dead. Isn't dead? No, as he, we saw in the. Uh, he took it in the shoulder, and then he was in getting the, modified. Yeah, I think he's gonna have like some new skills now. I'm like, why didn't like if they? I mean, this is a nitpick, but if you're gonna mod him. They should have really fucked him up, like right, right, you yeah, know, yeah. Instead yeah. of a one shot in the shoulder, yeah, yeah, he should have been in an explosion Take a blast to the face. or a blast to the face. Yeah, I that can would see be that. Cool. Yeah, but um, what was yeah. I going to say with Cad Bane? He this was the first element and only element of the show that felt like really gangster. Yeah, like you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then what did you think? You know, Boba Fett and him face off, and then. Boba Fett seemingly kills him off. Do you think that's a mistake to you, well, look, get rid of him? I think that maybe he's not dead. They say they, I've it heard people say there's a beeper on him that's flashing. Off, oh, so it's like some in, it's some indication that somehow he's still alive. Okay, yeah. Well, I think that it's if he is dead, it's the biggest mistake this show has made because the only good thing that came out of the show is the introduction of this character, honestly. Uh, obviously, much. aside from the Mando parts. Yeah. But that's the new thing that came out of this show that I like that I'm like, I'm on board 100%. And honestly, I wanted him to win in that battle. Do you know what they're going to do? In 20 years, there's going to be a Cad Bane show and yeah. he's going to suck and be boring. Yeah, well. <laughs> nah, nah. But like... You know, like yeah, I actually... I you know, there's a problem when... I, as an audience, I'm rooting for the title character to die. Yeah, it's kind of, it's crazy, right? Yeah, and honestly, it would have made the series better if he died. Well, he's got no like, story. Yeah. Like, why not kill His him His time's off? done, you know? Yeah, and he's old. Like, yeah, just pass the torch to, I, 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 it would make more sense if he's dying and Fennec Shen's like, um, who's going to run it? You know, who's going to run this thing? And he, he goes like, you know, you were always like the smart one, you know, in this operation. Then, yeah. It makes sense that it's you. It, it's, it was going to be you. And, yeah. you know, I'm really like, okay, this show hasn't been a total disaster. Um, yeah. He well, barely wants the job at the end. And he's like, this is what it's like. And I'm like, fuck you, man. Like, you, 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 <laughs> why were many we watching people this? died because of this. Yeah. And you barely want this? Then, then. <laughs> What are we doing here, guys? I mean, I, I, I could charitably reading that I can see. Oh, you know, he's tired and it, yeah, it's, it's just a joke. It's just grumpy. He's like yeah, a grump. Yeah. But look, it's just. But I, I see what you're another saying. Another straw. It, it's it, the last straw on the camel's back. Yeah, it really feels like it adds to the feeling of like, why, why are you doing this? <laughs> like, because you never really, you know, the motivation is even Cad Bane asks him, "What's your angle?" That's bad Cad Bane, but you know what I'm saying? Hey, I like it. I like it. <laughs> and, and Boba Fett doesn't even really answer. Yeah, because he, he doesn't. Because the writers don't really know. <laughs> I think the best line that Boba Fett actually says uh, in this is in this final episode where uh, Cap, what's his name? Cad Bane. Cad Bane is, goes like, you're, you're getting soft in your old age. And then yeah. he goes like, we all do. I like that. That was a because cool. Yeah. I, and I think that you should have played into that because he should have played into into look i know you guys thought that i was this i'm this notorious warrior that everyone's scared of but you know i'm in my old days now but i i'm wise and well, i've been through some shit to know that you know a different path you, well, you know yeah i think they should have if they wanted to re revamp a Boba Fett, I think they should have gone that way where he is wiser now and he's a little above the petty fighting. Yeah, I think they could have done a story about a guy confronting his mortality in a really cool way. Yes. Because, and it's right in Return of the Jedi because, yes, he's in the Rancor, but how he ends up in there, it's a really like stupid mistake. Yeah, like, yeah. And it, it's this idea of wow, a really dumb mistake can change your life. Can change my whole life, and I can yeah. be in the most horrible situation. Yeah, that's like a very humbling experience. They do, to be fair, they do hint at that in the show because you know his priorities change and stuff, but not in it a was, clear way. Not in a clear way, and it, it requires a lot of uh, charity on the yeah, viewers' part to put that be, together. It might be an accident, honestly. It, yeah, well, I don't think it was on their mind. Yeah. They, yeah. I think they're just like we need this character to be redeemable and and positive, so let's give him a reason. You know, I think that was like the the approach. Whereas, yeah, I don't know. I think with this, a uh, Disney owning Star Wars, they they really need to stop 
shying away from having, um, you know, a very morally ambiguous or outright villainous main character mm. because, you know, a lot of the supplemental Star Wars material before Disney bought it, a lot of it was about like villains, yeah, like bad. That's what gave the universe like variety. Like you're in their heads and you well, you're in their point of view and you could kind of root for them. Mm. We should be uh, able to root for bad guys. Like don't keep it this fucking middle, middle of the road, hemming and hawing, have your cake and eat it too. He seems tough, but he's really got a heart of gold. Works for Mandalorian perfectly. Yeah. I'm not saying do the same. Th- yeah, what I'm saying like, is like, don't be afraid to have an obviously villainous character. Just, be that way. Yeah. You know? Yeah, exactly. Don't run from it because you're just compromising compromising the integrity of what you're doing. Like it's and it gets confusing. Uh, yeah. Um, I'm just very so it's fine that the show is bad, honestly. But I'm just very uh, I'm not upset, but I'm just like frustrated by their need to inject such monumental Mandalorian moments into this show uh, because what's going to happen when season three comes around and i think you're going to get a lot of casual star wars fans who only watch the mandalorian and they're like oh this boba fett thing no thank you or people who watch the first two and they're like not for me yeah and they're gonna start this this season three of mandalorian going oh what just happened like how did this how did they get back together i mean obviously (laughs) they're not stupid so obviously they're gonna make make it make the show in a way that makes sense but i'm just so disappointed that they uh shoehorn these two episodes in this these two episodes of the mandalorian focus ones would have made a great Season Open, three, premiere. yeah. Season three, the first two episodes of season season three. You know what it feels like? You remember those like network TV shows where like there's the first season and halfway through they're in production enough to hear people's complaints, yeah, and then they can change course. They can pivot, yeah. It, it felt like that. It felt like that here, but but that's impossible. Yeah. So the writers must have done it. Like, oh, this Boba Fett show is not interesting. What if we added some Mandalorians? It feels like that. Like they got bored and they were just like, let's just. Look at the Mandalorian stuff. Yeah, they're like and put it, it almost the key like, moments <laughs> yeah. that you needed for season three. Really, just shove them in here. Yeah, I are we actually going to have Baby Yoda's choice be in this show? Like, it's such a monumental choice where we where he has to choose between the Jedi path or the Mandalorian path, and we're gonna have it in this other show. Like, I'm so shocked. And they do it inside one episode. Yeah, you know. Um. Yeah, it's. I, I think it's part of their MO, which is a, a need to rush to the, the fireworks factory or, you know, whatever whatever you want to define it as. But a, as a result, it's kind of rushed and a little little hollow. Like, it's it's kind of... It's exciting to watch. Like, a lot of this show is actually pretty boring for me, honestly. But yeah. there was definitely some episodes and moments where I was, you know, entertained and I liked it. Um Another waste of potential is uh, the sanctuary because I like the woman who runs it. Yeah. And, and, you know, in a regular show where the political intrigue of the whole mafia situation comes into play, she could could have played a very pivotal, let me show you the ropes of how things work here For sure. kind of character. I thought they were going to do that. Yeah. In the uh, first episode. Completely uh, missed opportunity. And she, now she's blown to bits. If I... <laughs> this is kind of weird for me to <laughs> give suggestions to the makers of like or the writers uh, uh, but hear me out on this okay like don't just look at star wars for inspiration if you're doing star wars like george lucas was inspired by a mixture of things and he made star wars don't just be inspired by star wars to make more star wars like look at all kinds of other things and see if you can incorporate it. Like, look at real gangster movies Mm. and have that inform how you do your gangster Star Wars show. Like, don't (laughs) just do watered-down Star Wars with gangster dressing. Well, the thing is, I think they do, but uh, they do look at other uh, influences, but they are basically influences of Star Wars. So yeah. I, they, they pay homage Lone to... Lone Wolf and Cub for yeah, Mandalorian. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and I think in this season too, there are like a lot of direct 
Oh, maybe it's just visual. Maybe it's just visual, but there are just a lot of direct references to other westerns and kind of yeah. I uh, think I think yeah. Maybe and even King Kong. Really. Maybe yeah. Maybe <laughs> with the rancor for sure. Maybe just for my taste, yeah. the western well is running kind of dry. Uh, yes, because that is the original one of the original for a new influences hope. of for Star Wars. So yeah. if you want to tell more original quote unquote stories with this property. Uh, the mafia thing is a great idea, for sure. but give us actually that and not just, yeah, 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 you're exactly right. Like not just fake Star Wars with mafias with, you know, uh, I don't know, the Godfather sprinkled in. Yeah, yeah, you exactly. Know? And, and you Give know, us the Godfather in the Star Wars universe. Yeah, and we're not saying it has to be as good as the Godfather because that's a very unfair uh, uh, expectation. <laughs> of course. But like, you know, take, gen- like really watch those things take them apart and see what makes them work and incorporate it. Yes. Like don't just fucking head faint at it (laughs) and not not do any, because it's frustrating more than anything. It's like, I can see how this could be cool and you are somehow not doing the work to make it so. Yeah, exactly. Um, So yeah, if I, if we're giving this show a rating, I do want to give it a rating. Yeah. Yeah. I'd I'd give it five out of 10. Mm. I, I would overall, some episodes were like, an eight or a nine, the Mando ones. Yeah, some were like fucking three out of ten. Overall, I, out yeah, I five. think I, I think I give it a five out of ten as well, just because I obviously I have a lot of problems with it, but I don't hate it. I didn't it's, hate it's it. It's watchable. It's, it's, it's a just more frustrating yeah, and hateable. And and it's just that I'm more frustrated at the the macro decisions that are being made because obviously it delivers us two and a half golden mandalorian centered episodes and i can't fault that like they are great episodes they are and uh and while the boba fett stuff is uh, un uh, ultimately uninteresting they're they're not horrible like they're fun to watch you know in terms of at a very like basic level of shooty shooty yeah for you sure know, like spectacle <laughs> yeah. or whatever yeah, yeah uh, you know but yeah it's i mean calling this show flawed is like an understatement yeah. you know like it's barely a tv show it's it's like a i don't even know what it is it's like a uh like a frankenstein's monster of a limited series you know i, I don't know it, it's weird like it it tells fractured stories it feels like <laughs> a first draft of a yeah idea yeah you know then you go to the second draft and you're like well how does this flow together mm. and then the third draft you obviously have like the the high points um yeah this just feels like kind of a vomit of ideas some are good and some are not so good mm. um yeah so i'm i'm really looking forward to Mandalorian season three, though. Yeah, uh, yeah, of course. Because Same. obviously they know what they're doing there, um, but maybe, maybe don't do Boba Fett season two. Maybe just leave it. Yeah, <laughs> as if they have ideas for it. I, uh, like, you know, <laughs> if, if this had enough eyeballs, they're gonna make more of it. But I, w- I would prefer not, not to see that. <laughs> like, uh, I yeah, mean, just yeah. Honestly, Boba Fett, um. This, uh, Boba Fett is better suited relegated to one episode of The Mandalorian. Yeah, he's a side like character. He, that's, that's it. What he's like, always been. He should be the one. He, the Mandalorian calls for help, not the other way around. Yeah. Yep. You're absolutely right about that. Um. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I think that's it. All right. For this episode. Uh. Good to have you back. Oh, uh, good to be back. Yeah. I guess our next part might be the Batman. Yeah. Hopefully, we can get to that screening but we'll we'll do that really really soon yes as soon as that comes out um yeah it looks great very excited uh, do you have any recommendations uh for the people who you know are looking for something to watch um well right now if you haven't watched it i think a few people are watching it but peacemaker is uh genuinely great i if you want to see like an example as a counterpoint to boba fett of like pulp tv just done very well Mm -hmm. um i definitely recommend that and um yeah how about you jump in on ozark everyone i'm on ozark the final season part one i've just finished that 
Um, it is, uh, especially now I know it's ending, it's a very intense and kind of, it, it feels like a uh, successor to uh, Breaking Bad. Obviously, it's not a direct direct successor, but it does a lot of the same things that the, uh, Breaking Bad did. And, and with very interesting characters with really great performances. So uh, if you're looking for a reason to jump on that train, you know, you've got like three and a half seasons already there, ready for you to go. Well, there you have it. <laughs> uh, okay, have a... Well, until next time. Bye! One, two, three, four. Surroundings, the catch twenty two of the sun and the moon. You may diminish and disguise it, but there is light in the darkness. Take a closer look at what's right in front of you. Oh